Our uh, call to worship today is from 1 John. It's uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Please remain standing for our hymn of prayer. It will be hymn number 12. presence, your spirit, and your love abide here in this place. Prepare our hearts for worship. May our thoughts and words be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Thank you, Catherine Cash and Tim Hansen for enhancing our worship with your music today. We welcome you to the Vallejo Drive Church. We're glad you could be here to worship with us today. If you're a guest looking for a church home, we just send out the welcome mat and we pray that you will be blessed in our worship today. Uh, next Sabbath is our monthly potluck, so plan on coming, attending, and bringing food to share with folks. Also, this is a time of year where we have the nominating committee at work and folks will be reaching out to invite you to participate in the ministries of the church. We ask you to open your heart and mind to God and even if you're asked for something that may not fit you, maybe you could volunteer for something else. But God needs all of us to be actively working together to make this church a blessing to others. We are planning a pictorial directory. It's been four years since we've had one, and we're going to be taking pictures beginning in the month of August. You may want to sign up for a slot. Uh, you can do that starting today after church. There'll be other opportunities in the weeks ahead to do that, but keep in mind, we need you to, to register. It, it must be important because it's in the bulletin twice here, so that, I, I guess that's to get your attention. So take it seriously, okay? I'd like to invite Israel Alari to the platform. Uh, Israel is, I don't want to call him an old friend, but a friend of many years. <laughs> he pastored here in our conference, uh, had the University Church uh, in downtown Los Angeles, uh, has been many other places throughout the world. He's just accepted the position uh, of the principal of Glendale Adventist Academy. He and his wife, Olari, uh, excuse me, Augusta, Olari, Augusta is right up here in front. They come to us from uh, Babcock University in Nigeria. Israel was called to be the pastor of the church there, Babcock University, I understand, is the largest Adventist university in the world, over 10,000 students. He was the pastor of the church there, and he just has been the assistant to the president, chief of staff to the president there, and they're returning here to the United States to educate their son. Enoch. Yep. Enoch, okay. And uh, we had a great need here, and God brought the answer to us. Israel, we're glad to in invite you as our new principal of the academy to share with us an invitation uh, for our students. Good morning, Vallejo Drive. Oh, that is awesome. I like that greeting. And uh, to my friend, your pastor, Dr. James Kyle, and uh, my friend of many years, not old friend, uh, Pastor Mark, I want to thank you all for extending this opportunity to me to share uh, with you about your school. You know, it's amazing that uh, things would turn around and I'll be back here. One of the times when I came here, I came here because La Center, where my children went to school, presented their Christmas plays here. And that was years ago when Ariel Quintana was the music director for La Cruz Center. But thank God that he brought us back this way to uh, Glendale and to Glendale Advanced Academy where we have excellent faculty. Uh, you all know I don't have to reintroduce to you our music uh, uh, director, music teacher, faculty. Um, and his wife doing a great job. Um, where is she? Oh, well, nice meeting you. <laughs> Excellent music program and the spiritual program there as well. And uh, there are so many beautiful things that I'm discovering as I'm coming on board. But one of the things that I believe that God wants to do ultimately is to raise godly seed for the kingdom of God. And he has made us seed handlers. You know, he's the seed owner. And we as faculty, as parents, as the church, we are the seed handlers. And I'm excited that God has entrusted this seed into our hands. And I know that with all that Vallejo Drive has been doing over the years, I went on uh, to your website and I saw some of the good things you're doing in Christian education with uh, scholarships, I mean, 
50% scholarships to that extent, and so many other things that you're doing for Christian education. I'm really excited. By the way, let me just ask, is there any alumni of GAA in the house? Anybody who, wow, wonderful, awesome. Oh, great. Well, hey, I'm in a good place, and I thank God because you are doing such an awesome thing, and uh, not just because of what you give as the constituent church. Vallejo Drive actually is the biggest giver in terms of subsidies to the school, and I think we deserve an applause for that. Thank you, Vallejo Drive. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, we appreciate that. And also individual donors who are doing a lot to keep that school going. You know, our full staff will be 18 FTEs, that is full-time equivalents, but because of financial uh, challenges of these times, we are down to about 14 or 14.5. So we believe that God can use all of us to bring it back up because the excellent program we have is bringing dividends. I'll close with this story. I came into the office and I met a young lady, Paige Singleton. I have her permission to use her story. Paige just graduated and I was just asking, what are you doing after this? She said, I'm going on to Pepperdine University. Oh, that's great. What are you studying at Pepperdine? She said, sports medicine. I said, wow, that's amazing. So how are you going to pay for that? She said, I have a full ride. A full ride? What does that translate to? She's getting $60,000 a year out of 69. And this is a young lady who came through our schools, challenged financially because of her uh, background, but with a worthy student fund and uh, an academic uh, scholarship and an athletic scholarship, she was able to finish. And she finished with flying colors. So there are many other stories like that of what your dollars are doing and what your contribution is doing at uh, GAA, uh, Glendale Advanced Academy. So I look forward to working with you. Uh, our registration is on the 17th of uh, August, and our first board meeting for board members, September the 3rd. So we're looking forward to seeing you all there, uh, those who are board members, and thank you very much. We have some inserts in the bulletin. If you have anybody that needs to sign up, I'll be in the foyer, and I'll be helpful. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank, thank you. you. I just want to add one personal note on behalf of Israel. Thank you. you know, these are two very accomplished people. He was assistant to the president there, and his wife was the chair of the social, social work. work department there. They left that to come here on faith. They left all their stuff there, and they need to, some help with uh, furniture startup. and startup, whatever it is to get started. If any of you have any um, items that you're willing to share, let us know. We'll help them out. I, just happened to have a, a nice dining set. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> Just wondered what I was going to do with. Now I know. Thank you. <laughs> so, but anyway, any of you can help uh, with them. Uh, let us know, and we'll help them get, get going. God bless. Thanks. And, and thanks Thank for you. sharing. Boys and girls, it's time to come forward for the children's story. And for all the moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas, and friends, Please come stand at your feet, reach out, shake some hands, welcome people to church. the children come on down I have a special surprise for you I have a special story
I still see some of you coming. Good morning. I am so happy to see you guys here. As always, every time I come here, I see all these beautiful faces. And I, let me tell you, it, it's, it's a pleasure. And I bet that mom and dad sitting out there are so happy to see you here too. And so is everybody else. Now, who knows what a magnet is? Yes. What is a magnet? It sticks to stuff. It sticks to stuff. Okay. How about you? What is a magnet? Huh? We know, but we don't know. What is a magnet? It's, it attaches to metal. It attaches to metal. Okay. Like a, a glue? It has glue and it attaches to it? No? All right. Well, we all know what a magnet is, and we all know what a magnet does. Now I want to tell you something else. This week I was working at home. I was doing some, uh, some work and uh, all of a sudden I pull up my, uh, my little bag of tools and I decided to uh, start doing some work and uh, with that I, I pull some wrenches out and I you know, start fixing things in the car and around the house and a screwdriver. Did you know there are two types of screwdrivers? There's a Phillips screwdriver that has a little cross in the center, and there's a uh, flat screwdriver, and then I pull up a little pair of pliers, yes, and these are cutters, and, and uh, oh, uh, here's another screwdriver, and, and there are all kinds of tools in here that, that I, I was using to fix everything around, and oh, and there was a hammer, I also use a hammer to, uh, you know, to make sure that a couple things that I was working with are... We're, we're fixed, and, uh, and, and what else? So here's a, here's a funny-looking plier. It has a little tip on top. And as I was working with my tools, I, I realized, you know, there, there are so many different tools, and each tool is able to do something different. See, this one here has a number 13 on it. That means the size of the screw or the bolt needs to be 13 to fit this tool so you can crank it and tighten or release it or and, and this this other one here here has the number 17 that means it's bigger and this one right here this one right here a tiny one it's a small one and this one has a number if i'm not mistaken is it eight or nine yeah it's a it's a nine so depending on how big that number is is a different tool and what a tool can do uh now i was thinking that did you guys know that in in that people are are somewhat like tools that everyone can do something different. The, you know, someone can tie a screw, the other one can, you know, nail a, a, hit, a, hit a nail, the other one can tie the screw, and the other one can, can tweak a little wire, and, and there's different of screwdrivers. And, but now I want to talk to you guys about a magnet, because after I had all my tools, and I was working with my tools, I was thinking, how can I pick up all these tools? And they were all over the place. And then I had an idea. <laughs> I have a special thing to pick up metal. And what is that? It is a magnet. And then I pull up this little magnet that I had and I went like, oh no. Oh, it, it does stick to things. It does stick, but it's not what I'm looking for. And then I remember that my dad gave me this. Haha. <laughs> this is a Super magnet. Super magnet means that if I have my finger in between this magnet and a piece of metal, it can actually hurt. It's so, so heavy. And I want you to understand one thing. If I'm comparing the tools with a whole bunch of different people, everyone can do something different. I want you to think of this magnet as God. And look what happened when God approaches the people. Are you ready? Watch this. Look at all, oh, look at all that. Look at all that. 
That's what happened when God gets close to people. People get attracted to God the same way that a metal gets attached to a strong magnet. Now, what I want you to remember is that we can also be like a magnet to other people. And we can have this effect of attracting people and not letting it go. And we can be a magnet just like God is. Okay? Attracting people to God. Now, I do have a little piece of magnet. It's not as strong as that one. But I want you to take it home. And this you can use to stick something on you, to your refrigerator, a piece of paper, a picture. And every time you grab this piece of magnet, I want you to remember that we can be a magnet attracting people too. Okay? Before you go, come over here and I have a little piece of magnet for you. Good morning and happy Sabbath church again. And uh, today we have a special time for prayer because our life is like water. If we cup our hands together and take a handful of it, we'll immediately begin to watch as it seeps through the cracks of our fingers until we're left empty handed. From our very first Inhale, inhale until our last exhale, our life force is steadily trickling away from us. We live for the sake sometimes of those few water droplets that inevitably continue escaping our grasp. But today, God invites us to a different life, a life in which we don't overwhelm ourselves with an unavoidable a life in which we find deeper meaning and appreciation. And this mentioned, water is our God. He will satiate all our needs, heal all your and me, and me life battered hearts, free us from sin, and give us hope for a new life. And now, brothers and sisters, I call upon all of you for us to pray to Jesus so that he may be the only source from which we seek our water. And also, we'd like to invite all of you who have a special prayer request to come forward at this time as we sing the song, as we come to you in prayer. Please.
if you are able to please kneel for the prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, today we are gathered here before you, our humble hearts and guarded asking for your guidance and forgiveness. Thank you for always watching over us, even when we don't recognize it. Forgive us for the wrongs we've done and help us onto the path of goodness. We ask that your spirit fills our hearts and minds, guiding us through your footsteps so that we may bring lights and also bring people to you as the true water. It is in you that we find love and harbor. We ask this through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
I, I wish you could see your faces when she's playing. What a blessing. And we thank, thank her for that wonderful selection. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you now for being our God. As we open up your word, speak to us and direct us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. If we could just turn that mic down just a bit, so in case I, in case I get happier in the spirit or something, I don't overwhelm you with uh, the sound of my voice. Good morning, church. Reach over to your neighbor and say, Happy Sabbath. Also tell them, if you, if you were going to miss any Sabbath, you should have missed today. Because next week, the pastoral staff, we will begin an eight-week series on portraits of grace. We're going to look at how grace has been operative in the lives of eight biblical characters and how those lessons can apply to us. We'll begin that on next Sabbath. And so we want to make sure. So if you're going to miss any day, you should have missed today. Because you don't want to miss any of the next eight weeks. So you can't leave, though. We already got you here. So you've you got to stick with us. My message this morning is entitled, Scandalous Love. Scandalous Love. Have you ever asked yourself lately, what's up with the church? If you look across the nation, our church doesn't seem to be what it used to be. Have we come to the point where it seems like the church may have run out of gas? If you look around, the attendance is down in almost every church. There are some churches that I know of where you could drive a truck through the church and you wouldn't hurt a soul. There seems to be little effectiveness in soul winning. Many of our baptistries are so dry they have to be serviced before they can be used because they never get used at all. Even our own young people have lost interest in coming to church. The millennials all watch church for the most part on their computers rather than coming to be with the people of God. So it makes you ask the question, have we perhaps missed some vital ingredient or strayed away in some fashion from the path that God would have us on? Well, I believe that there are a few lessons we can learn from the scripture that we have for today. And I want to shed some of those lessons with you. It's found in Luke chapter 7. And we're going to do several verses, but we'll begin uh, with the story of Simon, who had a feast. He was a Pharisee, and he ordered a feast for Jesus and invited Jesus and his disciples to come to his home for this feast. Reading in verse 36, it says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, although Simon was a Pharisee, he was a kind of believer in Jesus Christ. Um, he had not really fully accepted Jesus as a savior, but he thought he might be a Messiah, someone to liberate them from the oppression of Roman bondage. So there are three lessons I want to give you today before we go home. Lesson number one, if Jesus is not your Lord, he won't be your savior. Before he becomes your savior, he has to also be Lord of your life. This past week, I had a phone call from my physician. I'd had some blood work done. And he called me because he was concerned that my iron levels were too low. He said they're only half of what they should be. My ferritin was okay. My, I was, I'm not anemic. He says, you're a vegetarian, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, I think you need to have more iron in your diet. Now, when a doctor tells you that you need more iron, to a reluctant vegetarian, you couldn't ask for a better day. In my mind, I had visions of Morton Steakhouse. I saw my car driving up in front of there, and, I'm, and I was going to run into the steakhouse with a prescription from my doctor saying, porterhouse, three times a week. <laughs> but my wife, who loves me so much, had a, what she felt was a better idea. Raisins, 
and sunflower seeds. <laughs> I am thrilled. You know, that's kind of what it is, the difference between a Lord and a Savior. We don't want a Lord, but we'll take a short order cook. We don't want revelation, but we'll take the menu. We want what we want. And so as I munched on my raisins and sunflower seeds, I realized that my visions of steak just vanished. There are many of us who don't want a Lord because our visions of what we want to do might be disturbed. Simon had been healed of leprosy, so he was certainly grateful to Jesus for his healing, but he didn't want to submit to Christ. And like many, he wanted deliverance from the problems of his life, but he didn't feel like he needed a Lord. You know, sometimes we're, we're prone to be our own gods and we run our own lives. In fact, wasn't that the temptation from the very beginning in Eden? That Adam and Eve were tempted to become gods, to have the knowledge of good and evil. Some want Jesus to be their sugar daddy, a genie who grants them every wish they want, but they don't want Christ meddling in the affairs of their lives. We are comfortable with a celestial ATM God who you just put in the hallelujah pin, word, pin number and just blessings fall out of the sky. But there are some obligations to being in a relationship with God. In fact, the whole notion of relationship with God is not necessarily scriptural. When you look at scripture, we don't relate to God. We serve God. We serve him as Lord and master of our lives. He calls himself our friend. He calls himself our father. We are joint heirs. But our relationship is one that we are in obeisance to God. We move on to the next passage. And we look at chapter 7, beginning at verse 37 and 38. And for many of you, this may, oh, you can still read that, it's good. It says, and behold, speaking on this story, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Oil. Now let's unpack that for just a minute. This woman, it says, was a sinner. She lived, according to the NIV version, she lived a sinful life. Now her sins were something because she was notorious. Everybody knew that she was a sinner. Can you imagine what happens at Vallejo Drive when the, quote, sinner walks through the doors? And people say, psst, psst, there he is, there she is people who have a known reputation for being sinner. And the odd thing is that everybody who's pointing is also a sinner. Turn to the person on your left. Now look at the person on your right. All three of you are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This woman, we understand from Scripture, was Mary Magdalene. She was known to be, biblical scholars believe, a prostitute. In fact, Jesus had cast seven demons out of her life. And we're not quite sure if he cast all seven out at once or cast demons out over multiple occasions. She was the sister of Lazarus and Martha. What must it have been like to be the black sheep of the family with a famous brother like Lazarus, raised from the dead. But no one in her village knew that she had been converted. Her reputation preceded her. So when she saw Jesus, and she knew he was going to be at Simon's house, she was so grateful that she had been saved, that she had been redeemed, that 
she had had her life changed dramatically by God, that she came with tears in her eyes. Now, in Palestine at that time, when you sat at a table, they weren't tables that were sitting up three or four feet off the ground, they were sitting very low to the ground. So you would sit down on the ground, rest on one elbow, and put your feet behind you. And so she came up behind him and began to cry over his feet. And then she took her own hair and dried them off. Then she kissed his feet. And then she put oil from this alabaster box. Now, the story gets much more interesting. Verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. You turn this down just a bit. He spoke to himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, I think we're going in the wrong direction. Can we bring the volume down? Can everybody still hear me? You know, last, the other week I asked for people who could not hear me to raise their hands. And I was reminded afterwards that that was pretty stupid. <laughs> because if you couldn't hear me, you wouldn't know to raise your hand. <laughs> so I'm going to change it this week. Can you hear me? Okay, all right. Very good. So it says that if, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So here, Simon now is confused. He thought Jesus might be a, a Messiah, but now he's allowing this known and notorious sinner to not only cry on his feet, to not only dry them with her hair, but she kisses his feet and then takes very expensive ointment and anoints his feet. So now Simon is in a, he's in a pinch. She's got to do some damage control because a prostitute has turned out his party. His guest of honor now looks like a scandalous man and people are starting to wonder, who is this guy that he lets this sinful woman even touch him? Simon was offended at Jesus. He was upset by Jesus. And basically, if the conference office had been open, Simon would have called the conference on Jesus. And said, you know, you sent a prophet over here. He got an issue, right? Lesson number two. Jesus is comfortable in the presence of sinners. That ought to be good news to us. Jesus is comfortable hanging out with people like you and I. What a new, what a message. You know, we could ask, why is Jesus so comfortable in the company of prostitutes, publicans, and sinners? Well, because the Bible teaches that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He says, them that are well have no need for a doctor, but only the sick. So he's comfortable because being with us was his mission. But a better question is this. Why were prostitutes, sinners, so comfortable with him? Jesus never condoned sin, but he never discarded or threw away a broken sinner. Could it be that when Christ performed his father's business on earth, that he actually attracted the lost, the destitute, the shameful dregs of society, like that mag that we saw in our children's story. I believe that Jesus was so attractive to the lost that they migrated to him because they felt that they could. He was safe to be with. They felt safe in his presence. Being with Jesus was like being in an oasis, in a desert of criticism and scorn and condemnation. Could it be that the church is so unlike Christ that we have exactly the opposite effect on people that Jesus had? Could it be that we are actually repelling the lost rather than attracting the lost? And may that possibly be what's going on in terms of church attendance, in terms of why people are not flocking to be with us. I'm going to talk more about that, but we're going to look at verse 42, or verse 40 through 42. Um, let's see if I can get there quickly if I've gone too far. Up, 
gone too far. Okay. We're going to look at verse 40, and this is where I'm going to test you. I would like for you to pull out your Bibles and read with me. One of the things I try to do is never put all my texts on the screen so that you can read them along with me, and that way I can know that you brought a Bible with you. Everybody got a Bible? And I love what Pastor Peter said the other week about, what do you call those phony, phony Bibles? Yeah, phony Bibles. I, I like that. Okay, verse 40, Luke chapter 7. When you, say, when you find that, say amen. Okay, seven people found it. Where are the rest of you? All right, here we go. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And if you continue reading in your Bibles, Simon got the point. He said the one for whom he had forgiven the most. But Simon was a debtor who owed the most, but he saw himself in his mind as a debtor who owed the least. You see, Simon's sin was actually greater than Mary's sin. You ask, what sin? Well, we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, I'm sorry, Desire of Ages, page 566, Desire of Ages 566, that Simon was the one who introduced Mary into prostitution. Makes you wonder how many God-fearing men have been the ruination of women. I'll let that kind of marinate for just a minute. I want you to think about that. It was Simon who led this woman into sin. But Mary, on the other hand, saw herself as the greatest debtor. She knew she was a prostitute, but she knew it was Christ who had lifted her head and brought her out of perdition, and now she was free from sin and the pain of it all. For Jesus to show love to this sinful woman was a scandalous thing in that village. Just as love for sinners today in the church can sometimes be scandalous. You see, Jesus loves who we won't love, and that is the problem. He loves the people we don't want to love, and because of that, it makes it hard for us to understand why Jesus wants to love these people. They seem so unredeemable. When her perfume filled the house with fragrance, I believe that the fragrance was like the sweet smell of grace. You see, grace is always disruptive of the status quo. Grace reaches the lost and goes after them and calls them back home. Grace looks beyond my fault and sees my need. Grace can just smell up the house. But the sweet smell of grace was not provided by the deacon, not provided by the elder, not provided by the, by the Pharisee. Instead, it was provided by the prostitute. Lesson number three. Every church needs a scandalous lover. What do I mean by a scandalous lover? Someone who is fully aware of their need for a savior and in gratitude for that grace smells up the place. Their love just overflows because they know what they have been. And not only does every church need one, every church should be one. We all ought to be these scandalous lovers. You see, when we, need, we need scandalous love because we want to attract the lost just as Jesus attracted the lost to himself. If we had more of these kinds of lovers in our church, we would have less hypocrisy, we'd have less problems in, in, in uh, meetings, business meetings, fewer fights, less gossip. With more scandalous lovers, we'd act more loving and more accepting and more welcoming of the lost so that when they come in our church, we wouldn't shun them and push them aside. I had the opportunity a few years ago 
uh, when I was a member of the Berean Church and I was a, a senior in medical school at UCLA, my senior year and my internship year there, I had the opportunity to start a homeless feeding ministry called Operation Hope. And we went out and we fed 1,500 homeless people down on Skid Row every Sabbath afternoon. We fed about, fed about 300 in the church during the week. We met all kinds of people out there, many of whom we found were former members of the church who had been put out of their homes and placed on the street because they either had a drug habit or they had perhaps contracted HIV or AIDS. We found there were talented people amongst the homeless. And we got the bright idea of bringing the people back to the church to put on an AY program one Sabbath afternoon. What a mistake. You should have seen how the saints responded when we brought a busload of homeless to the church. That would never happen at Vallejo Drive. That would never, I didn't get an amen in the house. People moved. They didn't want to sit near them. And within a matter of weeks, they kicked us out of the church. In terms of the, the ministry we had at the church feeding, they found a reason to put that whole ministry out of the church. So we had to go feed someplace else. If we had scandalous love, if Glendale knew that there's one place in this city where people genuinely care about others. We wouldn't have enough room in this church. And love has no respecter of economics. The rich, the middle class, the poor, all want to be loved. And they'd all be here. Because they know there'd be no judgment no one turning their nose up at them. We would stop judging each other and finally the self-righteous would find no room for their self-righteousness. We need scandalous love, the scandalous love of Jesus to break out in this church as if it were a, a virus, something that takes hold. So lesson number three, Every church needs that, and I'm going to move on if I can get this to work. Here we are. What if scandalous love was infectious? And I believe it is. You see, when you love somebody, and they can soak up that love, they have now something that they can pass on to somebody else. It becomes contagious. It becomes infectious. The church needs this. What we really need we need more prostitutes. We need more Marys. Someone who is so grateful for what God has done that they're willing to smell up the place of grace and love and acceptance of all who are around them. Picking up in verse 47, it says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem with the church today is that we have been forgiven so little because we don't see much to be sorry for. Therefore, we ask for little forgiveness. Because after all, we're vegetarians. What do we have to ask? You know, you, know, you heard about that, that poem that says, if you ask me, do I smoke? No. If you ask me, do I drink? No. If you ask me, do I dance? No. Do I go to nightclubs? No. Do I eat meat? No. Do I have any fun? No. <laughs> we
we have so little to feel sorry for that but we are really under self-delusion. You see, we are still born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So you came, you know, even the cutest baby. You know, as a pastor, I can never say a baby isn't cute, right? All babies are cute. But have you ever seen, you know, just on occasion, a really ugly baby? And what do you say when you see that really, you know, it's not everybody is beautiful. You, you see an ugly child, you say, oh, hmm. You're trying, you're trying to find some words that will not harm. And so you just kind of say, hmm, man, you must be proud. <laughs> but even that baby born in sin. In fact, that baby will one day become a toddler. And you will meet that toddler at the Ralphs. And they won't be obeying their parents at all. They'll be pulling stuff off the shelf and screaming and hollering and having a tantrum. In them. And you know, you just want to hug him, don't you? Just, just, if I could just hug your baby for just a second. Early in their lives, they begin acting out. But you know, here's where we get fooled. Because we don't do anything, we think we're all right from the sins of commission. We don't, you know, we haven't murdered anybody. We haven't stolen from anybody. We're not doing crack cocaine. We're not doing all the things that would be the obvious stuff to get you put out of the church. And you know, we have this little list of things that, you know, we're ready to put you out at a, at a drop of a hat, right? You're still with your same spouse. You're not cheating on them. Therefore, you say, what do I have to worry about? The problem for the church is not the sins of commission. It's the sins of omission. It's what we have omitted to do. In fact, if you look at Matthew 25, where Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats, the characteristics of the sheep and the goats were not things that they did. It's things that they failed to do. You didn't visit me when I was in prison. You didn't comfort me when I was sick. You didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. It is what we have failed to do that puts us in far more jeopardy of our souls than the things that we have done. And so if you keep looking at the stuff that you have not done and say, well, I didn't do any of those things. I must be all right. It's not the bad. It's the good that you could have done that may put us in far more jeopardy than that. We need the scandalous love of Jesus in our hearts. Love that sees the needs of others without looking at pedigree or, or worthiness or merit. In fact, people who actually we should be loving do not merit your love in your own mind. They never do. Why would I want to love my enemies, which is Jesus tells us to do? Scandalous love is best bestowed upon those who merit it less and least, like you and I. So let me read you something from Christ's Optic Lessons. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly produced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Mark and I were talking about this passage. We agreed this is not just an individual perfection. This is corporate revelation. When we as a body demonstrate the character of Christ, then he can come. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Have you felt the new creation in your own life? Because if you're still acting in old ways, you may not be in Christ. Jesus told us that the world would know us because we love one another. They would know that we are his disciples. What do you think really hinders the evangelism of the city of church today? 
I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I think the world has a, a bad case of mistaken identity because we don't act like what we and who we claim to be. If we acted like who we claim to be, then they'd have an, a, a true identity of who we are. And our evangelism would be much more profitable and much more successful. We don't look like followers of Jesus because we don't love like followers of Jesus. So should we be surprised when sinners steer clear of us? Should we be shocked that sinners want no part of us? But don't fool yourself. It's not our high standards that repel the lost. It's our low loving. Not high standard, low loving. And if we could lift our love quotient, then the lost would be safe around us. Where is Mary when you need her most? When will we humble ourselves to see that our debt is far greater than those we shun and that we have been forgiven much? Today, we need the scandal of unconditional grace. Grace that will not let us grow. Grace that will not turn any one of us loose. Because grace is all we have. And grace is really all we need. And grace is always without condition. Loving as Jesus loved is really not an option for us. Because we find in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love his brother who he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And then in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The scandal of love is that it is never, ever deserved. And it is always needed. We never deserve it, but we always need it. Even the worst of us is still in need of love. So look around the church and pick out the one who you know to be the worst of us. And remember, even that person needs the love of God. My time is almost up. I want to close with a story. A soldier had been convicted of dereliction of duty. And he was due to be shot by a firing squad at 12 noon the next day. His fiance couldn't take the idea of losing her, her love. And she knew that he was not guilty of what they had thought he was guilty of. The next day, they lined him up and all the soldiers with their guns were ready to shoot him. And the commander was waiting for the clock in the bell tower to strike 12. He looked at his watch and realized that nothing had happened. And they kept waiting and they kept waiting and they kept waiting and the bell tower never tolled. He finally sent someone up to see what was wrong with the clock in the bell tower. And what did they find? They found this soldier's fiance had tied herself to the bell clapper so that every time it swung, they heard nothing. And they untied her battered and bleeding body and brought her down to meet the commander. And they revived her. And the commander looked at her and said, if you love this man, this much, there must be some good 
in him. And he released him. When Jesus died on the cross, he bestowed worth on every soul. And because Jesus died, we have been released. We are made free. Free to love, free to serve, free to grow in the image of God. Every head bowed and every eye closed. There may be someone here who recognizes that you have not loved as God has loved you. You may feel like that woman, Mary, before she met Christ. But I encourage you to love like Jesus loved. You see, when Jesus fills the heart, love naturally flows. Loving the ungrateful, loving the undeserving is the hardest thing we'll ever do except when it comes naturally. When my heart is filled with God's love, it naturally flows from me and from you. If you want the love of Jesus in your life, if you want to be able to love others the way Jesus has loved you, and you want to commit yourself to that kind of relationship with your God, that he could freely love the world through your life, through your hands, through your talents. Would you just stand with me as we commit ourselves to being a people of love? And as you stand, I will be praying that God manifests himself in your life. Lord and Father, we stand not because we are worthy, we stand because we are needy. We are in need of the blessing of grace, the blessing of love. And we pray that as we stand, that you will recognize our desire and our intent to be more loving than we have been. That you will fill us with your spirit and then love others through us. That you will remind us when we're tempted to be unloving and to be judgmental and to be coarse and crass. While where our heads are bowed, there may be someone here in this church who wants to give your life to Jesus Christ and prepare for baptism in our next baptism. If you are here and you know that you've been outside the ark of safety, you want to come inside the, the household of faith, just raise your hand that we can see you and make sure that we can make those arrangements for you to be a part of our next baptism. Raise your hands high. I see your hands, sir. God bless you. Would you see me at the door when we're through? Is there another, another hand? Anyone else? Am I missing anyone on the balcony? I don't want to miss you. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Keep us, save us, is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Let the church say, amen. Please be seated. It's now time for our offering. Our offering goes to our church budget. We want to thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity that you've ex exhibited over the last few weeks. We have a steep hole to dig out of in our church funding and church financing. Your faithfulness is certainly required and appreciated. Let us pray for the offering. Father, as we now prepare to give, touch each heart. Allow us to be liberal and generous in our giving that your kingdom may be advanced on the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
stand for our closing song, hymn number 79, O Love of God, How Strong and True. As we leave this place, may we never leave your presence. And may we study the cross to understand the depth of the sacrifice made on our behalf. We love you because you first loved us. Amen. Be seated.